morning. Let's get started. It's uh, it's time. It is. It's time for PCAM. Um, so it's really cool that everyone comes to office hours. I like office hours. It's fun to get to interact with everyone on a more personal basis. I'm thinking about having more of them maybe on Thursday. So if you have an opinion about when it should be on Thursday, please post that on the Facebook page and I'll look at it and see, what, uh, see if there's any sort of consensus. My schedule isn't completely flexible, but I will take people's preferences into account. So, you know, go ahead and if you, if you have an opinion, please put it on the Facebook page. Um, so we're, ta we're, at this point, we're talking about rotational spectroscopy. We're going through the different kinds of excited states that, that molecules can be put into as a result of interacting with electromagnetic radiation. And last time we looked at this picture that's, that's the big picture of spectroscopy. And let me see if I can fix the screen because that's going to be annoying. All right, much better. Okay, so right now we are way in the bottom of the ground electronic state and we're all the way in the bottom of that well in the excited in the ground vibrational state and we're just talking about exciting rotational transitions on their own. And last time we got around to talking about a rigid rotor in a plane, so like a linear diatomic molecule that's in a plane and it's rotating about the z-axis. Now we need to talk about the more general case of something that is rotating on a sphere and it has more degrees of freedom. And again, you've seen this last quarter. This was described as a particle on a sphere and or the hydrogen atom wave functions which of course are familiar from general chemistry also. So we can write down our Schrodinger equation for this and now in our KETs we have two quantum numbers to keep track of, L and M sub L, because those are the, the quantum numbers for the, the spherical harmonics. And we remember what their values need to be. And if we write down the Hamiltonian in spherical coordinates with R fixed, because of course we're talking about a molecule that we're assuming to be a rigid rotor so the, the atoms aren't vibrating around, here's what we get for the Hamiltonian. And that should look really familiar from last quarter. And I definitely recommend if it's a little rusty, go back and remind yourself how to convert things into spherical and cylindrical coordinates and check out the Hamiltonians for, for these things because I'm not going to go through and solve the Schrodinger equations for these systems. So I'm, I'm assuming that you've already done it. We can just use the results. I am, however, writing them down in Dirac notation just so we can get used to making that transition between uh, these things. Okay, so here's the results. We can write our Hamiltonian in terms of the angular momentum operator, L squared, and here's what we get. And so from that, we can pull out our energy eigenvalues. So things that should look familiar. This Hamiltonian, the solution to the Schrodinger equation in this kind of a system, and um, these energy eigenvalues. I also want to briefly talk about commutators because the commutation relationships of the angular momentum operators are going to be important for things that we're doing. And so, you know, again, this is totally review from last quarter. If two operators commute, then it doesn't matter what order you do them in. And an example that I know you've all seen is position and momentum. And we talked about this last time that in terms of angular momentum, the equivalent pair of uh, complementary observables are angle and angular momentum. We can't know those two things with infinite precision. 
And so I'm sure uh, this is familiar enough, but now let's look at it in terms of uh, the angular momentum operators. So angular momentum is going to come up over and over again in PCHEM. So this is kind of the, the most literal version of it when we're actually talking about a molecule rotating around and we're looking at its rotational states. But it's worth spending a little bit of extra time thinking about angular momentum because we're also going to need to deal with it in terms of spin. And things like electrons, um, protons, C13 nuclei have this intrinsic property called spin that is kind of mysterious, actually, but it behaves in the same way as angular momentum. Math mathematically, we can treat it using the same formalism as something moving around. And so this is going to come up over, over and over again, and it's worth looking at these things. OK, so if we look at our angular momentum operators in the x, y, and z directions, here's how they're defined. And you know, again, this should be familiar from from last quarter, but maybe we're looking at it in a little bit different context. The main thing that I want to point out here is, well, first of all, just remind you what they are. And also, I want to point out that they don't commute with each other. And in fact, they have a special commutation relation. You can prove this to yourself. It's kind of tedious. But if you look at these, at the commutators of these angular momentum operators and work them out, Here's what you get for their commutators. The commutator of LX and LY is ILZ. The one for LZ and LX is ILY, and et cetera. And we call that a cyclic commutation relationship. So we have the set of three operators, and their commutators are related to each other in this cyclic way. Question in the back. Sorry, what's, the, what's the capital D again? The capital D is the, um, it's the partial derivative with respect to whatever the subscript is. So it's, so it's defined down here on the, the right. Just uh, it's a useful shorthand for later on. We're not going to have so much space. OK, so that's just some, uh, those are some useful properties of the angular momentum operators. I'm going to have you prove in the homework another one of their properties. But so now let's look at the actual spherical harmonics. So we've been talking about a particle on a sphere, or the general case of a molecule that is free to move around in any way in space, and we have to deal with its angular momentum about each of the three axes. So we have, you know, we can have rotation around z, or y, or x, and we have to, to be able to, to deal with that. So OK, they don't commute with each other. Let's look at the eigenfunctions of L squared. So L squared is the total angular momentum operator. This is a pretty fundamental property in quantum mechanics. And just to remind you, here's what the spherical harmonics look like. And I see people writing stuff down. Don't, you don't want to sit here and try to draw all these things. You know, the, these will be posted online. You can also Google spherical harmonics or hydrogen atom wave functions, and you'll see lot, there are lots of you know, neat 3D representations of these that you can play with. But I want to remind you what they are and draw a connection to what the functions look like mathematically. Because one of the things that you're going to have to do in the practice problems is we're going to look at selection rules. And we're going to say, OK, can you have a transition from a particular state, a particular rotational state, to another one, and you're going to have to do that based on symmetry, which means that you're going to have to take integrals with respect to these functions and say, all right, do these things overlap by symmetry? And there are a few ways to do that. One is if you're really, really good at visualizing stuff in your head, you can look at these things and imagine whether they overlap. Um, unless you're really great at drawing stuff really fast, that's not going to work in the, the context of an exam or something like that. So you need to you know, remind yourself about the, the symmetry properties of these things. And so it's important to know what the, the functions actually look like mathematically. So again, we're going to represent our states. You know, you've seen them as y sub l, m sub l. That just means they're described by these two quantum numbers. We're going to look at that in Dirac notation by just sticking those two quantum numbers that we have to keep track of in the, the ket. 
So the state 0, 0 looks like this. And then as we go through, we can put in the rest of the Legendre polynomials. Again, if you're frantically writing this down, don't. You can, uh, you can look it up. I just want to remind you that these, these familiar shapes from the hydrogen atom wave functions have mathematical forms that are easy to write down, and we know what they are. And we can take integrals with respect to them and do things like figure out whether they, whether they overlap and get, derive the selection rules for different rotational states. So another thing that I want to mention here is that in quantum mechanics, we call you know, all of these states that we're talking about wave functions. And you get really used to thinking about that in terms of an electronic wave function. So don't get confused about that. Here we're talking about different rotational states. Later we'll be talking about vibrational states. There are all kinds of different things that we have wave functions for. OK, so that brings us to practice problems, which these are going to be posted. So, what, so things that I would like you to be able to do, I want you to show that L squared commutes with LZ. So we already said that LX, LY, and LZ don't commute with each other. You can prove that to yourself if you want. It takes a long time. But I do want you to show that L squared and LZ commute. And I would also like you to take this LZ operator that we have in Cartesian coordinates and convert it to spherical coordinates. Have you done this before? Is that something that came up last quarter? OK. So you've, you've seen it but haven't necessarily done it? Is that? Yeah, it's good practice. I should go ahead and do it. And there are also a bunch of extra practice problems Many of them are from the book. Some of them are not. Some of them I made up. They're not posted yet, but, but uh, I'll do it as soon as I get back from lunch. So the, the practice problems that are going to be posted on the website, two things that you need to know about them. One is there's a lot of them. Um, the other one is you don't have enough information to them all right now. So they are practice problems for rotational spectroscopy and vibrational spectroscopy. So if you don't know how to do all of them yet, don't worry, you will. You'll see it as we go along in class, or you can read ahead in the book if you, if you want to. Somebody had a question in the middle. Yes? Uh, for their answers, do you want to post your answers, or are you going to post them later? Um, I'm not going to post the answers. However, you know, if you ask your TAs nicely, they'll probably help you with it in discussion. I will definitely help you with it in office hours if you want to come, um, anything like that. But uh, I'm not going to just post the, the key. OK, so we talked about where rotational spectroscopy fits in in the grand scheme of spectroscopy. You know, it's a very humble, modest little spectroscopy. It doesn't take very much energy to do it. Um, we talked about some properties of angular momentum, which are going to be important for a lot of different things. Let's get into the details of rotational spectroscopy. OK, so one of the things that we really need to know to get started learning about this is the rotational constant. So it's called B. It has a tilde over it, which indicates that it's in strange units. And here's how it's defined. It's just h bar squared over 2 times the moment of inertia for the particular molecule. Now, as we see when we look at the pictures of different molecules that have different shapes in the book, some things have more than one moment of inertia. And that has some implications for what their spectra look like. But this rotational constant tells you something fundamental about the molecule, because the, the moment of inertia is in there. And it comes up in the spectra. So let's talk about what that tilde means. That means that its units are in wave numbers. <clears throat> and in the context of rotational and vibrational spectroscopy, whenever you see something that has a tilde over it, that's what it means. It means it's in wave numbers. And part of the, I think one of the hardest things about learning spectroscopy in general is that it is the land of messed up units and sloppy notation. And we just have to deal with it if we want to read the literature. It's an old field. A lot of this stuff is historical. It's not uh, necessarily consistent among different parts of it. And there are sort of different units. So all right, so the wave number unit in and of itself isn't sloppy. 
that's just, it's defined as reciprocal centimeters. And why do we use it? Historically, it's because, you know, when we're talking about rotational and vibrational spectra, this is a unit that gives us reasonable values. You know, we don't have values of, you know, gigantic numbers. So a typical rotational constant for little molecules of the type that we're talking about is something like a tenth of a wave number to 10 wave numbers. And for vibrational ones, it'll be, they'll be larger. So now, why do I say it's sloppy? Well, when you get into the sloppy notation is when people start expressing energies in wave numbers. So that doesn't make sense, right? We have a reciprocal wavelength and people are referring to it as an energy. And you'll hear this, like if you go to seminars, people say it. They're skipping some steps. So if we have something that's in wave numbers, we can get the frequency of that uh, electromagnetic radiation. And we know that the frequency is related to the energy you know, if you multiply it by Planck's constant. So there is a really straightforward relationship between this and an energy, and you'll, you'll see people use that as a shorthand. Okay, somebody had a question over here. Yeah. What is the speed of that equation? Speed of light. Um, how did you get from the uh, middle uh, portion there to the end portion? Because the, uh, each bar is going away, uh, taking it from like the uh, eight pi squared to the end of it. Yeah, that shouldn't be there. Okay. That's, uh, thanks for pointing that out. So yeah, that's, uh, that's relevant when we start uh, talking about the energy, but it shouldn't be in the rotational constant. All right, so if we're talking about a molecule that's, th that's free to rotate about three different <coughs> axes, now we need to consider different moments of inertia. So if we look at our classical rotational en kinetic energy, we've got these three moments of inertia, they're labeled A, B, and C, just to emphasize that it's out in free space. You know, we could call them X, Y, Z, but uh, what, however we wanted to find the coordinates, this is the general case. So this is a molecule, this is the case of a molecule that doesn't have any symmetry. It has three separate moments of inertia. And so it's classical angular momentum around any one of these axes is related to its frequency. And so here's its overall energy. And what we're going to be dealing with is the quantum analog of the situation. And we're going to, to look at what that looks like for the cases of different shaped molecules. Again, we're not gonna get into huge levels of detail about how you calculate the different moments of inertia for molecules of different shapes. That's a good thing to look up. Okay, so here's the, the general case where we have three different moments of inertia. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about simplified cases. So in the rigid rotor approximation, we're, we're making the approximation that the bonds are rigid and they're not moving around. So the, inter the internuclear distance stays the same. And we also have to worry about the selection rules. So selection rules are just telling us, you know, by symmetry, which transitions can we observe in the spectrum. And the gross selection rule, sort of the, you can think of it as, you know, it's sort of a, the large scale coarse rule, is that a molecule can only have a pure rotational spectrum if it has a dipole moment. So let's think about why that is. So if we're talking about doing rotational spectroscopy, we have some electromagnetic radiation, it's exciting rotational transitions, and you know, it's interacting with the E field of that electromagnetic radiation. And so you're only gonna see anything if it has a dipole. So the molecule's rotating around, and if there's no change in the electron density of the molecule as that happens, like say you have N2, as it's rotating around, 
there's nothing for you to observe. It's like a tree falling in the forest. You can't see it. It doesn't interact with that radiation. So, yes? Does M equal MA plus MB? Yes, it does. So, you know, again, I'm, uh, I'm not going to go into, you know, too much how you calculate these things. There's a really nice table in the book that shows you, you know, how to get the, the moments of inertia. We're uh, mostly not going to focus on it. Okay, so we're only able to observe these transitions if the molecule actually has a permanent dipole moment. And of course, it's chemistry, so you can't have a rule without exceptions to the rule. We'll talk about uh, what they are uh, as we get further on. But the gross selection rule is you have to have a dipole moment, you have to have some change in electron density as the molecule is rotating around in order to observe it. And we get the transitions when the molecule absorbs a photon and it's at, it's at resonance, it's at the right energy to excite it to a higher rotational state, and then it changes from J initial to J final. And so here's how we write that down in a more formal way. So we have our transition dipole you know, for that rotational transition, and we can write down its matrix element in this form where J sub I and J sub F are the initial and final states. And a formal way of expressing the gross selection rule is that that transition dipole has to be non-zero. And it turns out that the answer you get for what it has to be is that you can have delta J being zero. The molecule can just stay in the same state or it can be plus or minus one. And I'm not gonna prove that to you at this point. I will for other types of spectroscopy later. For this one, we're just gonna leave it at that. The derivation is in your book if you wanna check it out. But for now, let's just use the result and if everybody <coughs> understands how we're writing this down, I'm happy with that. Okay, so let's look at what the energy levels look like. So this is for a diatomic molecule, so it's really simple. So it's a diatomic molecule. We know that it has a dipole or we wouldn't be able to see anything. And here's what the spectrum looks like. So the notation is you'll, you know, you'll see J plus one and J or J prime and J. And um, the arrow is going in the direction of the transition, so you'll see these, these things written down. All right, so our rotational constant again is, is h bar squared over 2i, and the energy for a particular level j can also be expressed in terms of the rotational constant, so it's just that rotational constant times j times j plus 1. You know, again, just from the, the eigenvalues of the LZ operator. Which, you know, again, we, we have the result here of what it, what it is in polar coordinates, which you're going to show in your homework. Okay, so as a result of this, we see we have these equally spaced levels, and the rotational spectrum has these lines that come in increments of 2b. And Remember that whenever you see a line in the spectrum, that represents a transition. So we have the levels, and, and then it's tempting to look at all those lines in the spectrum and think that those correspond to the levels. But remember that a spectral line is where you have a transition from one state to another. Okay, so if we look at the separation between adjacent lines, And this F with a tilde is your, you know, energy of a particular state in wave numbers. And we can write down our separation between adjacent lines and get a um, relationship between that and the frequency. So this is 
a fancy way of saying that we can look at the spectrum and we know that the lines are spaced in increments of 2b and from that we can calculate the rotational constant and we can get the moment of inertia of the molecule. And so we can figure out you know, something fundamental about the molecule from this kind of spectroscopy. Okay, so as spectroscopics method go, this one's a little lame. It doesn't actually contain that much information. I mean, so a lot, of, a lot of times you're going to know the moment of inertia of that molecule anyway, or there are better ways to get it. This is not, uh, you know, the most useful method in a lab setting. There are some situations where it is useful, which we're going to talk about a little later. The, the main thing is in space. It's really cold out there and you don't have the luxury of aiming a giant laser at some galaxy and seeing uh, what molecules are there. You have to deal with the, the ambient radiation. Okay, so before we talk about applications, let's just go through, you know, again, the notation is a little bit confusing. Let's just go through and recap what everything is. Okay, so E sub J is the energy of some rotational level J. And that's in normal good old energy units. <coughs> F of J with a tilde over it is the energy of the level J in wave numbers. So again, we can convert readily between real energy units and wave numbers because we know the relationship there. And if we have the, if we have nu of j of the transition j to j plus one, so again, nu with a tilde over it is, is your spectral frequency, but it's in wave numbers. And that is for a particular transition, j to j plus one. And that corresponds to the position of the line that you see on the spectrum when something changes from j to j plus one. And that sounds a little bit convoluted in terms of, you know, thinking about the energy level diagrams, but it's important because that's what we actually measure. If we take a rotational spectrum, that's what we're going to see. And so we have to, to know how to look at that and then back out all of this other stuff that tells us about the, the states. And then I have one more uh, confusing notational issue to uh, remind everyone about, which is that mu is the reduced mass, and that's a constant. And there's also an operator called mu, which is the dipole moment. And of course, that's an operator. How do you know the difference? Context. And if you get confused, please ask. So I know there are a lot of uh, notational things that are confusing and hard to get used to. We just have to deal with them. It's an old field that's been around for a long time. It's, uh, it's something that, that we just have to uh, learn how to read. Okay, so let's talk about uh, our rotational energy levels in a little bit more detail. So we're back to talking about a diatomic molecule. And these are things that, uh, that we've already seen. Yeah, we've already talked about that, so we don't need to, to uh, go into more detail about it. Okay, so what I want to point out now is that real molecules might not always follow the rigid rotor approximation. And that's something that, that we should be aware of. Okay, so I'm going to make this point by showing real data. So it's just a, a table of data. Don't write down all these numbers. But I think it really makes the point if you see what's going on. Okay, so for HCL, we can measure real numbers for these rotational transitions. And so I have some of the actual measured numbers for these uh, states. So the radius that we measure for HCL, if we look at, you know, again, we can just look at the spacing between the, the states and get the rotational constant and measure these things. And if we do that for different transitions in the spectrum, here's what we get for the radius in nanometers. So if we take the one from going from three to four, that's the frequency it has. And here's the bond length that we get. <coughs> 
we calculate it. And now if we take the higher energy states, the bond length starts to increase a little bit that we measure. And again, if we keep going, it increases a little bit more and a little bit more. And as we go up to higher energy states, our bond is actually starting to stretch. So what's happening is we have our HCl molecule. We're putting some energy in, and it's rotating it around. And at low energies, the bond does stay rigid. But at higher energies, it's rotating faster and faster, and there's some centripetal distortion there. And we can compensate for that. There is a correction term for diatomic molecules. I'm not going to make you use it for anything in particular right now. I just want you to know that it exists. So it's important to, to be aware that a lot of times we're using approximations because that makes things easy to treat and you know, we can understand the basics of how something works. But we should always know about the assumptions behind the approximations that we're making and understand when they're appropriate and when they're not. So if we're looking at really high energy states, this rigid rotor approximation might not be the best. It also depends on the particular chemical bond that you're looking at. So if it's a really rigid bond, if, the, you know, if, it's, very, if it's a very stiff kind of bond, then this isn't going to happen until much higher energy than it will for a floppier bond that, that can move around more. OK, so let's um, talk about the types of rigid rotors. So again, there's a nice table in your book of what all the moments of inertia are. But I just want to talk conceptually about what, what they look like. OK, so we have diatomic and, and uh, other linear molecules. And the uh, moments of inertia are defined differently here. And in the case of diatomic molecules, we really only have one axis of rotation that we're worried about. So if we have a diatomic or linear molecule, you know, we're looking at you know, the z-axis is here, and we're talking about rotation in this plane. We don't have to worry about the larger picture of you know, what's happening if it's rotating on a sphere in that case. And so the degeneracy of those states, g is the degeneracy of state j, is just 2j plus 1. And so all that means is that as we go to higher and higher energy, the states get more degenerate. There are more ways to generate that state than if you're in the low energy. And so if you have you know, zero angular momentum about a particular axis, there's only one way to do that. But then as we add more energy, the higher states become more populated. And part of the reason for that is that they have higher degeneracy. OK, so we can also look at an asymmetric molecule that has three different moments of inertia. And what that means is, so say for a water molecule, if I rotate it around the z-axis or if I rotate it around x or y, each of those things is different. It doesn't, it doesn't have any symmetry in that sense. So you know, in this case, we're not talking about, you know, we've spent all this time talking about rotations as symmetry operations. Here, we're not talking about it in that sense. We're just talking about like, all right, there's a water molecule in the gas phase minding its own business, and it can rotate about the x, y, and z axes. You know, in the x and y cases, that's not a symmetry operation, but it's, it's still doing that. And in terms of rotational spectroscopy, we have to worry about it. And remember, you know, on the picture here, the second molecule here is CO2. One of these things is not like the others. Remember that. Uh, you know, the gross selection rule is that you have to have a dipole moment to see the pure rotational spectrum. So I put it up here because it's an example of a linear molecule. For this particular type of spectroscopy, we're not going to see a spectrum for it. OK, so the other types of rigid rotors that we have are symmetric rotors and spherical rotors. And again, these, uh, these names are a little confusing. So the symmetric rotor is something like ammonia where we have two different types of rotation that we have to worry about. 
So we can rotate it around the z-axis. So that's around its principal axis of rotation. And then it has two other equal moments of inertia. And that's because it's symmetric in the sense that if we rotate it around x or we rotate it around y, those look the same. So that's the sense in which it's, it's a symmetric rotor. It's not the same as uh, the symmetry operations we talked about in the point group. And so one consequence of that is it has two different rotational constants, and they're called A and B. And they're defined as parallel and perpendicular. And you know, parallel and perpendicular to what? The principal axis of rotation. And on the bottom is an example of part of the rotational spectrum of CF3I, which of course is a symmetric rotor. So there are lots of uh, transitions going on there. Okay, so for the spherical rotor, all the moments of inertia are the same, and that's all, it, that's all that is meant by spherical. So something like methane, um, an icosahedral molecule like SF6, a buckyball, anything like that is going to be a spherical rotor, and we can simplify things by um, noting that all of these uh, moments of inertia are the same. Okay, so let's look at this for in, the in the case of a symmetric rotor. And I just want to draw the parallel between the classical and quantum cases. <clears throat> so for the classical case, here's the angular momentum. We've got two moments of inertia that are equal. We're calling them B and C. And, you know, so that has to do with I perpendicular. And we've also got I parallel, which is the, the unique one. That's about the principal axis. And so we can write down the total angular momentum. We can write down the energy in terms of that. And then we can also look at this in the quantum case by just making the analogy that we know what the eigenvalues of the uh, total angular momentum are. And we can relate it to the expression for the uh, position of the lines in the spectrum. So here's what you're going to get in terms of where the lines show up in the spectrum with respect to the two rotational constants, A and B. All right, so other things that we need to think about, we have different rotational qu quantum numbers here because rotation is quantized around each axis that we're worried about. So we've got a rotation about the principal axis, and then we've also got these other two rotational these other two uh, sets of rotational motion, and we have quantum numbers for all of those things. And so what that means is that, you know, if we have, if k equals zero, that means there's no rotation about the principal axis. So the molecule is in space and it's rotating, you know, purely around x or y or somewhere in between there. And if k equals plus or minus j, that means all the rotation is about the principal axis. So it's just rotating like this. So that's how you can think about the relationship between those quantum numbers. It's just, we're just talking about what direction is it quantized. And again, those are always quantized in increments of h bar. So it's, uh, it's written as h there, it should be h bar. And so for symmetric rotors, the specific selection rule is that we can have rot rotational transitions where k can, the, the uh, change in k is zero, and we can have delta j being plus or minus one, and then k also has to take these values up to and including plus and minus j. Is, Question? Is that increments of h or h bar? It is h bar. All right, so what that means is that for spherical rotors, we have a lot more degeneracy because there are more axes that are where things are quantized to be worried about. So in general, this rotor has a 2j plus one fold degeneracy because of its orientation in space. And it has another one 
with respect to its orientation on, in the molecular frame. So we've got an axis in the molecule. We've got an axis because of its orientation in space. And the degeneracy for this thing gets large really quickly. So if we have j equals 10, so we're only in the you know, 10th uh, state, there are 441 ways to get that. And this has some important consequences for what the spectra look like. So this is a simulated spectrum for FCLO3. And it's at one Kelvin. So it's really, really cold. This molecule is not rotating very much. So when it's really cold, you know, we're used to thinking about if we don't have much energy, everything must be piled in the ground state, right? Well, in these kinds of experiments, that's not true. And the reason for that is that the, the ground state is the lowest energy, sure, but there's only one way to get it. That state is non-degenerate, everything, you know, the, 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 there are entropy considerations, if you will, to, to getting that. There's only one way to do it, so it's rare. Whereas the little bit higher energy states just have more ways to get that value. And so we see that the maximum population is not piled into the lowest energy state, even at pretty cold temperatures. If we look at something at more like room temperature, we see a couple of things. One is that the distribution is shifted, and also it's broadened out a lot. So, so some really high energy states can be populated because there's a lot of degeneracy. There's a lot of different ways to, uh, to get that. And this is the introduction to kind of the first part of STATMEC, which we'll see at the very end of the class, but we'll try to bring in at least conceptual representations of this all along because it's good to have a feel for how it works. So to use another analogy, it's like saying, you know, the most likely state for the first midterm is that everyone gets 100 because everybody's really smart. And that's true. That's the, that's the lowest energy state, right? But it's really, really unlikely because there's only one way to get everything right and there are lots of ways to, to make little mistakes. So those, those uh, states are, are populated. All right, so um, the last thing I want to mention is an actual application of rotational spectroscopy. So I mentioned that uh, this is the main one. It's really useful for looking at interstellar molecules. So here's a picture of uh, this cloud of gas that has a bunch of molecules out it that's in it that's out in space. And many of the molecules that are known to be out there were discovered near this feature. And you know, how do you know what molecules are in space? So again, you can't shine a giant laser out there and do laser spectroscopy. You have to deal with the ambient radiation that's there. And it's really low energy. Space is cold. And so the way people do that is by you know, measuring these spectra using a radio telescope, and then they make mixtures of molecules in their lab. So you get these spectra that are a big mess. There's a whole bunch of different rotational states. And then they can kind of guess based on pattern recognition and knowing what the spectra of different molecules look like and make up mixtures of molecules in the lab that can match the, the spectra. So this is from, uh, these, this data is from the lab of Professor Lucy Zeris, who is at uh, University of Arizona. I visited her lab a couple years ago. It's pretty interesting. So she has two things. She has these giant telescopes, like she's uh, in charge of one of these facilities in Hawaii where you can, you know, she can log in for, from her computer in Arizona and run these giant telescopes. And she gets spectra from space that have a bunch of uh, rotational features of different molecules. And then in order to figure out what's there, she goes and makes mixtures of molecules that she, think, that she thinks might match in vacuum chambers that are really cold in her lab and compares the two. And so there's a, there's a lot of effort there in, you know, first of all, instrumentation as far as you know, being able to measure these things, and also in data analysis because you have to do a lot of pattern recognition and sift through a lot of spectra and compare whether they're the same or not. So this is what this stuff is actually used for in real life, and here's the instrument that you need to do it. So it's kind of exotic. It doesn't come up much. It's neat, but it's not used all over the place. 
Next time, we're going to talk about vibrational spectroscopy, which is used all the time in research labs, you know, and you've probably all used it yourself in the context of, of IR and maybe Raman as well. Okay, happy Martin Luther King Day on Monday, and I'll see everybody on Wednesday.